today I want to challenge you because first off, you're gonna, I'm going to share with you what our values are, but you need to ask yourself, what are my values? And do my values, are my values going to get me down the road or are my values going to eventually cause me to have an accident? So as we think about that, I want to read with you the scripture. I'm sharing a scripture this morning. How many of you know of Apostle Paul? Many of us have heard of him, right? If you've never been in the Bible before, you don't know what the Bible's about. Well, the Bible's about this man named Jesus, right? Who we believe is the Jewish fulfillment of the, of the prophecy that one day a Savior would come, a Messiah, someone to save the world from itself. And so Jesus came, and we believe as Christians that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament, the Jewish prophecy of the Messiah who would come. And we believe that Jesus himself was the Messiah. And we don't only believe that, but Jesus professed it. And because he professed it, he had to prove it. And he lived his life, and he died on a cross. And we believe that because Jesus died on a cross as the Messiah, as the chosen Son of God, that he could take over the sin of our lives and redeem us. So as we believe that in the very early church, there was this segment of Judaism or the Jewish religion called Christianity. Did y'all know that? That our religion is actually a step, the next step in the step of Judaism. And so we believe in the fulfillment of the prophecy. So in that world began the early church, the early Christian church, and they were called many things. Did you know that the early church was called Literally, they initially were not called Christians. They were initially called followers of the way. How many of you like Star Wars? And that little saying, this is the way, that literally was what the early Christians would call themselves, the followers of the way. See, because Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. A little later, they would become known as little, little Jesuses or Christos, little Christians. And that's how we got our, our term Christian, little Jesuses. And so as we follow this, Paul was a major figure in that. But you need to know about Paul's history as we read this. See, Paul was what was called a zealot. Do you know what a zealot is? When you read the New Testament, you're going to read about zealots. And zealots are these Jewish men who were almost rab rabbinical or like a teacher or they had a, a big place in their community of faith. And he was a strong Jewish man of faith. And he believed that anybody who preached false teachings should be held to the Old Testament, even to the point of death. So he was, a, in a sense of a modern day sense, he was a crusader for the Jewish faith. And so Paul was so, was so strong in his faith that he actually went out, and it is rumored and said that Paul participated in, if not directly, but indirectly, in the killing of many, many early Christians. Can you imagine? So one of the most famous men of all of Christianity one of the most famous men of all the world of Christian who's done the most, who they have built massive temples and massive churches and named them after St. Paul's Cathedral all over the world was one who participated in the slaughter of Christians in the early church. And we know that Jesus had already risen and gone to heaven when Jesus approached Paul. Remember that story? Where Paul is writing... And he's going on his way, and he's riding on a horse, and, the, and, and Jesus comes to him and knocks him off his horse, literally, huh? And says, Paul, why do you persecute me? And we know that Paul had a dramatic conversion. And he became, from the man who would help to murder Christians, to the man who would help develop the faith. And so Paul understood suffering because Paul had initiated suffering on the back to others, but now Paul would have to endure the suffering for which he would call the name of Jesus Christ. We know Paul was imprisoned. He was literally in many ship disasters. Paul would go all over the world. He would be the one to spread the gospel to the world. And so as we read and as we join, Paul is in, in this interaction with the church in Corinth. And if y'all remember the church in Corinth, called the Corinthian Church. That was a church that was sitting in the middle. It's a church much like the United States. It's in the midst of a lot of culture, advancement, wealth. It's in the, it's in the middle of, of this culture 
that's a dynamic culture with many different, right? In the United States, we have many different cultures, right? We have many different cultures colliding, and you can tell the, the frustration, right? And sometimes it's the difficulty, and sometimes, you know, someone brings food to your, to your job, you know, food event, and it's very different, and you're like, okay, I'm going to try it, maybe not try it. I don't know. I might try this. I might not try that. And we have these crossing cultures, and it makes stress sometimes, but it also brings about beauty too, right? Because there are things that you discover that you didn't know you didn't know, right? And so... Paul is in this realm of now in the city of Corinth is the church, and the church is struggling. And the church is beginning to forget why, why it exists. And so Paul writes to them to kind of help them out a little bit. He says this is Paul, and notice what he calls himself, an apostle of Christ. See, Paul is going to designate that I am one of those now. And so when you read that now, you don't read it lightly anymore, do you? Paul was the one who was slaughtering Christians. But now Paul is going to boldly say, Paul, an apostle of Christ. Now he puts himself in harm's way. He puts himself as a mark for the world to see. Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, the city, right? And with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul immediately begins to set the foundation of what this conversation is about. It's about Jesus. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by Christ. If you ever are in a bad place, this is a great verse to read because it talks about finding comfort and peace in the middle of struggle. Right now, I know our world is in the middle of, of chaos right now as we know what's happening with the war in Ukraine. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is your comfort and salvation. So he's saying, if I undergo stress, I know I'm only doing it on behalf of you. Does that make sense? He's saying, I'm doing it because I believe in what we're preaching. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. He says, not only do I suffer right now for you as to the church in Corinth, but there will be a day when you will suffer for the church as well. And so Paul is setting up an idea, and our hope is for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. He's saying, it's going to be bad sometimes right now, but there'll be a day when there'll be things that are better. There'll be a day when there are things that are much more to your liking. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia, for we are so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul is sharing with you. Paul went through episodes of depression. There were times where we can read in the scripture where he was very sad. He was very negative. He was very, he was in a bad place. And so he he admits that and he says, there can be so many burdens that we are in despair of just even living. And today I want to share with that because sometimes when we think about, you know, it's mental health, health awareness now is very obvious. But as a Christian group, as a church, we must realize that there are mental health barriers that we each all will struggle with. And it's okay. And he says, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So even Paul would understand his life was at stake here. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You must also help us by prayer so that by many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. You say, Sonny, why did you share that if you're talking about ways of faith values? Because the values that set Paul forth, the values that we're reading are the same values that we treasure today in the Christian community. And I want to share with you those. There's a word that Paul uses in there, and many of you have learned that church term, and you probably will see church's name, the church of Koinonia, right? And we, we like to take that term, and we like to use that term as fellowship, 
in the modern church, well, we're the church of Koinonia, or we engage in Koinonia, we, we engage in fellowship, but I want you to take a step a little bit deeper with that term. That term doesn't mean to fellowship in the sense of, hey, we just won the national championship fellowship. That fellowship is, in, is really used in the sense of we suffer together, we celebrate together. That's a deep word. It's, it's a lot deeper than when you read, and a lot of times we give this connotation in the Christian community that it means all great things. No, it means we suffer together and we celebrate together. So Paul's saying the church of God is about suffering together and celebrating together. So when you think about that, this is the right place for you today because we will suffer with you and we will celebrate with you. I have been here since ooh, 1995. That's my son. I have been at this church or what would become this church since 1995. I have suffered in this church and I've celebrated in this church. And I've suffered way beyond what many of you would know and I've celebrated with many of you as you may know. I've seen babies born. I've been to the funerals of those we love. Because I understand that in the Christian community, I don't get to just celebrate with you. God calls me also to suffer with you. And that's a big thing. And that's a thing that should encourage you because we're not here for you only when things are good. We're here for you when things are really, really bad. I love reading the stories of, of our church members who take steps into people's lives to love them when they're hurting. I've been, you know, if you don't know, my profession is a physician. And so I can get indoors in hospitals that other people can't get in, right? I just go and show my badge, and they're like, oh, okay, well, come on in. You know, when COVID's hitting, everybody's held out, but I can walk in the door with my badge because I'm a physician. I'm like, hey, I'm here. And they'll be like, what are you doing here? You're not on our roster. I'm saying, I'm a doctor. I'm here to see so-and-so. And they go, okay. So they let me through the door. And there were many times where many, some of our members were isolated and couldn't be seen. I would go and see them. I wouldn't tell you all about it. I wouldn't express it to you. But I would step in and I would say, you know what? We're a church of joining in people's discomfort as well as their comfort. And because I had an opportunity, I knew I could use it so that people in our church could be comforted. And so you have those opportunities too. You have those. And so what, is, what are we about here at Waves? Who are we? Well, we're a gathering. That means that was the, kind of the original idea of the church was just a gathering, right? We are a gathering that is valued by God. In other words, God has set us up. If you're not a Christian today, what you must know is in the plan of humanity, I'm talking about from the beginning of humanity till the very end of humanity, God has set up his church for a purpose. If you're not part of the church, if you're at home and you're watching on TV and you're afraid to come to church, you're missing out on the plan that God has had for his church. This is all part of God's great design. There is no accident in this system. God has set up the church. So we are the church that is valued by God. The Bible describes the church. You know how God feels about the church? Some of you have never been married, right? So you young people, imagine this. Um, this is one of your best imaginations you can have. Imagine that day that you and the other one hook up, right? Like, it's the day, okay, we'll make it very Christian. We'll say it's the night of your wedding, okay? <laughs> but we know sometimes people make mistakes. But it's the night of your wedding, and there that other one comes. And in that other one, you get to experience the beauty of everything about them. Nothing is hidden anymore, right? Clothes come off, right? I hope they come off. I don't know. <laughs> Clothes come off. And you experience that person in the fullness of who they are, naked before you. Nakedness is the most important thing we have, right? It's the thing that keeps us, like, away from others. And to expose ourselves is very vulnerable, right? Being very vulnerable. And so that's why in the bedroom, it's a matter of it's okay. Because you can be fully vulnerable without, without feeling like it's something negative. And so... You know what God compares his church to? Does he compare it to like a nice thing, a club, 
a social event, a funeral home. He compares the church to his bride. Did you know that? That's how important the church is to God. There's nothing else in this world that is compared so intimately, so strongly than for God himself, for Jesus to say that the church is my bride. So we are a church. We are valued by God. We are a family that is brought together through Christ. See, the Bible says that when you become a Christian, you automatically get a family. Did you know that? I can guarantee you here, I have family probably watching on by video, but I'm probably closer, or I am closer to many people in this church than I have ever been to any cousin or any uncle in my life. You really have become my family. You've become the people with which I walk arm in arm. We are an imperfect church. We know that, right? And even though we're the bride of Christ, we're an imperfect bride. We do have mistakes, and we worship a perfect, extraordinary Father, Savior, and Lord. So what are our values? Jesus is our message. Jesus is our message. Number one, what you need to know about ways of faith that will never, ever, ever be compromised is that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're never going to come in here and tell you, maybe there's another way to get to God. Maybe you can, you know, you can do it. And I, I know this will be offensive. I don't know if it'll cost me my job at a, at a you know, I, I'm also a professor at the university, a public university. I don't know if it'll cost me my job. I don't really care about that because Jesus is the way. I believe that. I've always believed that. I believe that since I became a Christian at the age of 11. I believed and I surrendered to Jesus Christ being Lord. There is no other way in this world and in this universe. I am making that statement right now. Before you, before whomever would want to know, it's probably on Facebook and it'll be recounted somewhere in the world. But Jesus is the way. We must always preach Jesus is the way as a church. There's no other way. We're not a Unitarian church. We're not going to say maybe God has another way. Maybe God's doing another thing. Maybe another faith is the way to get to God. No, no. Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus made the statement, not me. So if I follow Jesus... I must always preach the message of Jesus. And in our church, we will not compromise that belief. We're not going to sit here and, and walk with you and tell you, okay, well, you want to be Buddhist? That's great. Be a part of ways of faith. No, no, no. We're going to share with you Jesus Christ and hope that you take that message and receive it and hope that you latch on to Jesus being the way. Jesus is the way. So in ways of faith, everything we do must present Jesus as the way. It must present Jesus as the answer. And I know that for some of you, that may make you uncomfortable in our modern culture right now where everything is inclusive and everybody in, is a part of that message and everybody has a way and, you know, popular figures say, well, maybe it's another way or whatever. No, no, we stick with Jesus as the way. Okay? And in that message, it must be true. If you are part of faith, of ways of faith, that must be true. I would tell you, too, what we're going to share with you, values of ways of faith, are not just exclusive to ways of faith. It really is the values of the Christian faith. But we want to be very clear. If it makes you double think, I'm glad. You should double click. It says in the Bible, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Our job is to present Jesus to the world. And you say, why? why? Why is it that Jesus has to be the, why? why? Why pick one way? Why not pick another way? Part of it is because we know who Jesus was. And the other part of it is because God came to us, loved us, died for us, gave his life for us. And we take that next step of faith. If you're a man of science, I have more science probably training than anybody here in the room, I would think. But I can tell you, there's always a step of faith. There's always a step of faith. No matter how scientific you think you are, no matter, I'll challenge all my guys out there in the professor world, because I sit with them every week in a conference, and everything I hear, there's always going to be a step of faith, right? How many of you know, you know, when you get in that MRI machine, how do you know it's really showing your own body? Right? It could be flashing up pictures of something else. Because you believe and you trust 
that what is said. How do you know the technology is right? Because you believe and you trust. There's always a step of faith in life. You cannot get out of faith no matter who you are, how scientific you are. There's a step of faith. Always. We choose to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. What's our other core value? Relationships. Let me ask you, how many of you have come to faith since you've been here at Ways of Faith? Anybody here in the audience? You too? Do you want to come up? Do you mind coming up? No pressure. No pressure. I just want you to share with us what it meant, how did it happen, and what is it, how has it made a difference? I love getting put on the spot. Uh, no, it, it's, I think relationships really is what brought me to, to Christ. I think about, you know, I, for many of those that don't know me, my name is Ali. Ali is not a Hispanic name. <laughs> it's very ethnic from the Indian culture. So I grew up in a Muslim home. So some people may consider me like a Muslim to Christian convert, but I'm, I'm like, I, I never really practiced the religion but I didn't know anything about the religion. So growing up, if somebody were to ask me, like, hey, what religion are you? And I'm like, Muslim, I guess. Like, I don't really know. But I met a young man um, who was actually going to the seminary, and he never judged me about religion. He never made me feel guilty or judged about not having Christ in my life. But he would always throw little snippets at me, like, hey, you, you know, here's what I believe. And he would never judge me. He would just share little bits here and there, and it never caught up to me until much later when somebody invited me to Waves of Faith, and I really got to see what it meant to have people pour into you and have people love on you no matter where you come from, because part of, you know, Sonny's message is that we are imperfect people, but we serve a perfect God, right? We serve a perfect, uh, Jesus is perfect, and he lived a sinless life on the cross, and I didn't understand what that meant. Um, and I joke a lot that when I used to come into these doors, like, men would want to hug, and I'm like, don't, don't hug me, man. I, I'm not like that. Like, I don't like hugging. So, but that's because they really, truly love everyone that comes through these doors, no matter, and, and I'm telling you, and, and, you know, it's embarrassing to say, but there were Sundays I would show up here, hung over, you know, still wearing my same clubbing clothes from the night before. Like, we all make mistakes. You know, Paul was a murderer, and God used him. God can use all of us, and, and I've just really seen that as I've, I was, you know, I say raised in this church. I'm a, I'm a grown man now, you know, just early in my early 20s. Okay, I'm getting, I'm close to 40 now. You can see the grays, but I mean, we're growing every day, and, and I think, honestly, and first and foremost, the first time, I, I even remember telling my Ellie, my wife, I was like, you know, the only church I ever really knew was Waves, and, and I never felt judged there. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about the Christian faith is that people say they feel judged. And I'm like, we're not here to judge you. We're, we're not perfect. You know, we're going to make mistakes. We may make mistakes leaving these doors, right? Like, we may get in our car and, you know, curse somebody on the road. Like, I've never done that, you know. Okay, 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 okay. I think we've all done that. I'm starting to take over the sermon at this point. But what my point is, I really... <laughs> I really have grown in this church and, and even being up here to speak, you know, using one of my gifts. We talk a lot about having a servant mentality, servant heart. And, you know, I, I may not be the best at dealing with kids. I may not be the best at dealing with, you know, uh, moving equipment around. But, hey, I can get up on stage and speak. So I use that as one of my gifts to bless the Lord. And I'm great with technology. So I, I've really come to, to grow in this church and use my talents to serve the Lord in, in the ways that I can. So. Give him a hug, yeah, on the way out. Really close one, right? Hold for about three seconds. <laughs> we talked about that on Friday. What is a, what is a passionate kiss? And somebody said it has to last longer than three seconds. So. <laughs> but so it's true. Jesus is our message and relationships are our heart, right? We know that it's about building those relationships. Ali is a perfect example, and he has way more skills than I think he would admit to. But relationships are what we're about because Jesus was about a relationship, right? God came to fix human relationship with God, right? Jesus came, the very essence of why Jesus came, if you don't know who Jesus is and you've never heard the message or it didn't ever make sense to you, 
it was a broken relationship. You ever break up with someone, right? Did you ever get back with them? You ever, those of you who had to get back with someone, you remember, remember what had to happen for you to get back with them? You know, I dated Rachel for two years, and it was just a mess. <laughs> well, maybe less than two years. And we had called it like, you know, it's over, door shut. She, she uh, what is the, count, the, the common term? She ghosted me. <laughs> she literally did ghost me. I mean, literally. She wouldn't answer my calls or anything, right? She ghosted me. And so, and she sings up here on Sunday mornings, right? Like, how do you ghost someone <laughs> like that? It's not right, right? And you remember fixing that relationship. When, when the time came to fix or mend that relationship, Jesus came because the relationship between a sinful man who had turned the back on God, who had thought that they are God, right? As humans, we tend to make ourselves God. And he came because he needed to fix that relationship. So it's all about relationships. And so there are some here who have experienced that. Anybody here has experienced ways of faith loving on them in, in a critical time in their life? Do you want to share with us? Is there anybody? It just could be a few sentences. Anybody? Anybody? She's going to come up. Come on up. Yeah. Just tell us how, how that happened and how it meant, what it meant to you. Good morning. Um, I'm going to keep it short, I promise. Um, for us, a really pivotal moment in our life was we had just had our last baby, and we had only actually visited waves, what, maybe twice? Um, we were in a transition of finding a new home church. And so um, we came from a church where my family was there. Um, my parents are leaders. We had given our lives to Christ at that church. And I was like really just trying to hold on by a thread to leaving that church. And I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't really like it over there. Like, um, and so we gave, I gave birth to um, our, our fifth child. And so... Um, Right off the bat, once we announced that we had the baby, Pastor Mario, who graduated with my husband, reached out. Um, and he didn't even ask. He just said, hey, bro, we're getting, we're putting together a meal train for you guys. Um, let us know what kind of food you like. You know, how many of you are there? Is there any preferences? And it was just that simple thing. It was he found a need, such a small need to some people, and he filled it. Like I said, it was number five for us. And so the thought of having to cook dinner or him take care of the other four kids while, while I tended to a newborn and we had a 15 month old, um, that literally meant the world to us. Um, and to this day, he almost, you know, going into our third year, being part of Waves now, it, we still have, they still have that heart, that find a need and fill it, no matter how big or how small. And so that was really life changing for us. So relationships are our heart. And I think one of the things you're going to find out, and that's what Jesus was about, right? Did Jesus, you know, did Jesus put out, you know, applications to join the ministry? No, he called people, right? He would go to people and say, hey, you over there with that fishing, you know, a lot of you are good fishers, right? Can you imagine Isaac? You're out there fishing. Isaac can catch some fish. We did a fish fry with Isaac, fresh fish. It was awesome. Can you imagine sitting there and Jesus comes up behind you and says, hey, you know, put the pole down. Come follow me. Come, because I'm going to invest in you. When you read the Bible, Jesus often would go away with his disciples. Because he knew that to make these men see how they need God more, he had to be with them. And so for you and me, it's about that interaction. It's about our home groups. It's about interacting with you. Because you're never going to see what it's like to be a Christian by just hanging around non-Christians. That's the one thing that never makes sense to me for Christians, is all they want to do is hang around non-Christians. And it's like, it doesn't make sense. How are you going to know what it is to be like Christ? And for some of you, you know, you have to invest in others because they're going to invest in you. That's how it works. You know, there's a saying that, that you know, Christianity is only one generation from being lost. In our faith, you're not born into Christianity. I know maybe in some denominations they teach you that, but it's not true. You're not born into Christianity. 
you choose to follow Christ. And in that interaction is where you grow, is where you find that relationship. So relationships are our heart, which means we're always going to invest here at Waves in the relationship. Does that make sense? So if the relation, if there's a chance between me being right about where you are in life, but me also making sure that relationship is sound, I'm going to choose the relationship over being right. Guys, in marriage, when there's a chance for you to show how right you are to her, choose the relationship, not being right. Women, when there's a chance for you to show him, you know, if a snake, if it was a snake, it would have bitten him, right? That's the saying you always say because men can't find anything in their closet. <laughs> Instead of finding opportunities to be right, find opportunities to build that relationship. It's important because it's for important for God. So then iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Many of you have read this. You've seen it on a lot of wristbands and sports. Thirdly, discipleship is our mission. Do you know what a disciple is? Hmm? It's someone who wants to learn. And all we're saying here is that all of us are called to be learners of what it's like to be a follower of Jesus. Nobody has it perfect. You don't have it perfect. I don't have it perfect. I've been doing this since the age of 11. Still nowhere near perfect. We are learning to be like Christ. I can tell you when I look at my 20-year-old sunny self and I look at my I'm older 20-something sunny self, <laughs> I look at that self and I say, man, you were a jerk sometimes in your walk with Christ. Sometimes you were just way off. So my bigger fear today is not really, like, I think a lot of when you're young, you think, do you got all this right? My bigger fear now is, did I, did I lead people to Christ more than I made them angry? <laughs> you know what I mean? More than I, I hurt them, more than I pushed them away, more than I, I made decisions that weren't in the favor of them coming closer to Christ. So my biggest fear now as I get closer to dying, it's right, Rachel always laughs at me because forever I would tell her, from the second we got married, I tell her, you know, I'm almost 50. And now that I've crossed that mark, it's like now I'm almost dying. And so <laughs> it's the next phase, right? I always think now, I think a lot now about, man, I'm going to meet Jesus soon. I really do. And I'm like, what am I going to stand there and tell him? Because I know there's so many things that I didn't get right. And, and I'm thinking, man, did, did, did I make the right investments? Discipleship is investing. It's us learning together what it means to be like Jesus and to walk with him. Another one, if you're not around Christians, how can you learn to be a disciple? If all you hang around are your friends from high school who don't want anything to do with God, how are you going to learn to love God and live for God? Because when those times get hard, they're going to give you the worst advice. Women, you still surround yourself with the same girls that, you know, that you partied with. And when it comes time to hard relationships, what are they going to tell you? Oh, man. Oh, come on, girl. You can find another one. Right? You can find another one. Hey, he, he don't deserve you. But what does Jesus teach? To give and to live a selfless life. That's a hard one. And they're certainly not going to be on board with that. So, again, discipleship, it's how we learn. And, and Jesus said, and Cain said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Growth is our mindset. Here you're going to grow. How many of you have grown in Christ since you've been here? Anybody? Oh, we got quite a few. I need one to share how you grew. Anybody raise your hand? Who would come up here? What, what, in what area have you grown in life? Come on up. Raise your hand again. Come on, raise your hand. Now you don't want to? You can come up. My son raised his hand. With a man can come up. I want to know how you grew because, first of all, he's a little bigger than me. I'm taller than you, so. <laughs> uh, I think um, I've grown a lot since the pandemic, especially. I think. Uh, one of the main things that I've learned um, in my walk of faith is growing up in church, I always felt like uh, when I did something wrong, I honestly felt more like I let the people hear down more. I cared more about letting the people hear down than I did about letting God down. 
and doing the right thing. And it was more about not getting caught as opposed to actually understanding why I'm doing something or why I should not be doing something. And I think one of the ways I've grown the most is now when I have a struggle in my life, it's not about feeling the shame of seeing people's faces when I tell them something. Uh, Cause I mean, it's a blessing to have my father and to have like Eddie, my youth pastor. And I've like bald cried all like ugly cry in front of them. And it's not like, like I, I felt ashamed when I told them, but the love they gave me helped me grow and understand that it's not, I shouldn't be afraid of what the other people think of me. I should be focused on what God, uh, what he has for me and what his, what's important is that he, I'm right with him as opposed to being right with everybody else. And I think that's the way I've grown the most too. So a core value there is growth. I do want to thank our youth leaders and our youth ministers because many of you don't know what it's like probably to be in youth ministry because you're a little nervous and you don't want to help. Um, <laughs> youth ministry is the toughest ministry. I've done youth ministry many years ago, many years ago. I led youth ministry. We have our youth ministry. I want to thank our youth ministers because there are things that are put on their hearts and on their shoulders that you and I will never know, Right? You and I will not hear the cries that are spilled out by our young people to them. And they carry those burdens. They don't get paid much, if anything. But they invest. Who in the world invests in young people like that? I had a great youth minister. I remember that was probably one of the reasons why I didn't leave the faith. Because my youth minister, 24-7, I could call them. I could talk to them. I could ask them. In fact... The very girl who ghosted me (laughs) knows my youth minister, and it was my youth minister who I called when I finally said, I'm going to ask her to marry me. And And I knew in my heart I had to get several people to pray about it and to let me know that that was the right decision. And my youth minister was one of the ones I called years and years later and said, I'm going to get married. Will you pray? And will you, will you tell me whether I'm walking in God's purpose or not? Those kind of growths are amazing. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the, word of right, in, the world, in the word of righteousness since he is a child. So what God is saying is, as Christians, we are not expected to just be believers. We're expected to grow up. As you think about this, I want you to just think about that. As ways of faith, these are our values. Jesus is the message, Right? He is the message. We will never compromise that. We will never, ever give a second thought about it. It'll always be what we are. It'll be what we put our budget around. The next thing is that Jesus is also part of why we build relationships, right? Your relationship matters to us, with us, and with each other. We also want to build relationships. We don't just practice that just in our relationship with you, but we had a a marriage conference on Friday And we had people who were pre-married, which means that they're going out or whatever's happening in their life, but they're not quite married. And then we have people who are married and people who are early in marriage, late in marriage. We invest in that. And the reason we invest in that is because we know relationships go out as well. And your relationship matters to us in the other aspects, whether it's with your children or with your family. We also know discipleship is our mission. We're going to go out and we're going to make people disciples. We're going to show them what it means to live for Christ, and then we want to see growth in their lives, right? We want to see you grow up. I can tell you right now, I see a lot of people in this church who probably, if you knew them five years ago, you would be like, oh my God, they're different. Oh my God, they're just so different. They're a different person. It's someone I never knew. And then lastly, you know, as we think about all this, we want to share with you the vision is we are ordinary people living extraordinary lives. Now, I didn't set this up. All the people who came up here and shared with you did it all on their own, right? It wasn't a setup. I was like, hey, I'm going to call, and then you raise your hand, and then everybody who shared, shared on their own, and I want to thank you all for sharing because it's your sharing that makes this real, not my message. So I want to ask you today, as we close, 
You ever been a part of a group that does this? One of the best videos I ever saw on YouTube is this British pastor. And he says, when he's on a plane, you have to sit next to somebody, right? And they always end up with a conversation of, what do you do for a living? And he's like, as soon as I say I'm a pastor, people are like, hmm. You know, they turn their iPad probably a little this way because who knows what they're watching or what they're doing. He says, so when people ask him, what do you do for a living? He says, well, I'm technically a leader in an organization that has branches all over the world. We build hospitals, drug addiction centers. We reach out to people. We feed the homeless. We help those in despair. And not only that, we walk with them. We've been around for a long time. We have, we have consistency. An organization has been here forever. And then he says that people will send him behind like, oh my God, that sounds fantastic. Because yeah, I mean, we're building, we're building hospitals, we're building healthcare needs, we're, we're meeting needs all over the world, in every country, in many, many languages. And then they finally ask him, well, what is it called? He says, it's called the Church of Jesus Christ. Sometimes when you look at us, if you're not a Christian, if you've never been in a church, that is what we do. I have been around the world, and I have yet to see a hospital that says, Hospital of the Atheists. I've yet to see one. But I've been around the world in some of the ugliest parts of the world, where some of the hurting people are just tremendously in pain. And you know what I've seen there? I've seen the Church of Jesus Christ. The Hospital of Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus Christ. It's real, folks. Did you know that today in 2022 exists the most Christians that have ever lived on the planet Earth? Did you know that? There are more Christians living today on Earth than there ever was. Jesus' fulfillment of his scripture is coming. I will take my name to all the world. Did you know that? But did you also know that there are churches right now? The church in Afghanistan is almost the first church to be eliminated completely. The church in Central Africa is about to be annihilated as they are killed by the Boko Lukan in East Africa. That the church in China is probably the most powerful church in the, in the world right now. Did you know that? In the most oppressive government exists the most powerful Christian church in the world, in the world, not America, in the world, when they asked the pastors of China, what did they feel about getting rid of the communist government? You know what the pastor said? Oh, no. Because with that kind of stress, the faith is made real. I've been a part and I've sat with some ministers from China we used to have a Chinese student with us for two years, and I got to sit with men and women and families who invested in going to China to share the gospel. And they tell me these stories that are so amazing, that the people in China literally memorize the Bible because they can't always have a Bible. And you and I, you know, we'll be rocking it to whatever tune is out, right? But yet we can't even remember one scripture. The Christians in China will memorize the whole scripture because they can't have one in their hand. This is a powerful thing. This is God's church, and it will prevail. When you see war, when you see distress, know that God has a purpose. He is a just God. He will make things right. Maybe not today, but at the end, we know God is going to make all things right. It is unfair. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that has so many barriers and so many ridiculous things. And sometimes we partake at it as Christians, as churches, or whatever group you're a part of. But Jesus is the answer. And getting closer to Jesus gets you closer to knowing what God's heart is like. So I want to challenge you. If you don't believe in Jesus today, I want to encourage you that maybe this is the day that you make that decision. Maybe you want to be a part of this group that has over a billion members in many parts of the world and builds hospitals and builds all these things. How many of you have been on a mission trip? Raise your hand. How many of you have not been on a mission trip? Oh, wow. All right, we've got to fix that in the next few years, okay? 
We've got to fix that because you need to go out there and you need to share the gospel and you need to be fresh with it because it's going to matter to you in seeing the day when God uses whatever you did. And I know you don't think you could do anything, but just showing up to another country, they'll be impressed. You know what, you know what really impresses a lot of the world when you walk into their doors? Is that an American would come to them in their lowliness and their poverty and their restrictions in their lives. They're just amazed by that simple fact. That alone can be an impressive thing so that you can share the gospel. Don't be afraid. Let's pray. Lord God, I come to you right now. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, raise your hand and you want to know Christ. Okay. Pray with me this prayer. Lord God, I commit my life to you. I believe in you. I believe in what you've done. I believe you came to save me, to redeem me of my sins. Submit my life to you. Take me as I am. For all of us, I just want to lift all you up. Guys, you serve a God who loves humanity through his people. Help us never to let that grow old. No matter what political system you sit in, no matter what you believe, we are all believers. We are all followers of Christ who choose to follow Jesus. So let us unite in the gospel. Lord, I just pray right now, Father, that you would bring a spirit of unity in your church, not only here, but in this state, in this country, and in this world, Lord. As we see tragedies happen, may the church be more emboldened, Father, to step in, to step up for what's just and what's right, to step up, Lord, for what is good, to love people, Lord, no matter how imperfect they are, Lord, because they're just like us, to give of ourselves, to never tire of serving others. In Jesus' name, amen.